Yep. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the March meeting for Diamond Valley Writers Guild. I guess the camera's over there. I should look that way, shouldn't I? Um, we have uh, a great speaker lined up for today. I want to remind everyone on Zoom to please mute your mics, but if you, you know, aren't, you know, in, in curlers and pajamas, we'd love to see your faces on Zoom. So if you could put your cameras on, because this isn't interactive, this isn't a webinar or a one-sided stream, it is an interactive meeting, and we'd love to see who's, who's participating. But again, if you could mute when you're not speaking, and there'll be opportunities throughout to unmute and talk and tell, them, tell everybody what's been going on in your writing careers, et cetera. Um, real quickly, State of the Guild. I figured I've never done a State of the Guild before. So I, I wanted to let you know that um, we're looking really good. We've got a great lineup of speakers. Our membership is higher today at this time than it was last year. Paid members, our membership is up. Um, we kind of track from month to month at the beginning of the year how many people pay and, and what it looks like year over year. And this is the highest we've been in March um, since I've been tracking. So I'm really excited about that. A lot of new faces both in the room and on Zoom. And of course, you're welcome no matter what part of the world you live in. And uh, I'm gonna turn that part of the State of the Guild over to the treasurer, so she can talk about membership and financial. Jessica Bruce. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well, that you have your great hot cup of coffee and you're all ready and looking alive. So this morning, um, I'm here to tell you that we are doing really, really well. Um, to to give you some figures, uh, when we when I took off about almost three years ago now, um, we had a little bit over twenty five hundred dollars in the bank, and we spent uh, over the course of the last three years about three thousand dollars on the hybrid system that makes these meetings possible, which is a lot of money. So we've been we've been trying to you know push it up and make sure we, memberships coming and all that, and I am happy to report that we are almost back up to above pre-hybrid numbers. So we are well over $2,500, and we have lots of fun things planned for you and ways to enhance the hybrid system and get it going and be able to expand our reach even further. Um, so very excited. And this is a another reminder that if you have not renewed your membership yet, um, if you're in the room, I'm going to be back there. You can see me after, or you can uh, send it in through PayPal. We have a link on our website, or you just uh, send it to dvwritersguild.gmail.com. You can also send us a cash or a check through um, our P.O. Box, P.O. Box 1154. Um, so if you have any questions about membership, you can see any of us board members, Michelle, Lynette, myself, um, we'll help you out and we'll get you all set up. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, that being said, don't talk to Sophia or Kevin, even though they're board members, because, you know, they don't do anything with the money. Just teasing. Um, anyway, yeah, we're very excited at our last board meeting to discover that because um, it was a big leap of faith to go hybrid. It was either that or we either stayed 100% Zoom or we stayed 100% live. And we decided we had way too many paid members in 2021, people from five different countries and 17 states at the time. And we thought it would not be fair to either go live and there was a big push for people to meet live again. So we wanted to do this, and it was a bit of a gamble. We put out the money. Members stepped up with donations, and we were able to do it, and here we are today. I'm very excited about that. Member book page. Um, Kevin, do you want to say anything about the website, member book page, or the profiles? Go ahead. Sure. Um, if you haven't renewed your membership, uh, I'm going to be starting to take member or unpaid members' books off of our page. Um, we are currently about 250 member books that are listed on the page, and they are sorted on our on our site by publication date. And if you have a book coming up, for instance, Stacia's book that's coming up pretty quick, um, it comes live on March 18th, and I've actually got a, uh, a scheduled post that'll actually make her book live on our site on on March 18th. So feel free to give me your information before you even. Uh, have your book released. Um, also on the website, um, I'm starting, I've been doing a lot of work on the Straight Jackets Preservation Project, is what I call it. And uh, I'm actually looking at moving Straight Jackets directly into the Diamond Valley website. 
this will give us the advantage of with your member profile pages of having all of the articles you've ever written linked directly to your member profile page. And the other thing that I'm starting to do is I'm actually setting up a resources area in our forum so we can all discuss um, technologies, services that we've found and everything that help with book promotion, book creation, publishing, everything. So, uh, yeah, if you haven't created an account on the website, definitely uh, look into that right now. I've got all the information on the website in the Q&A forum. And uh, I think we're going to be sending out a email pretty quick regarding how to how to create an account. That's all I've got for today. Evan, he is doing a fabulous job. If you've not seen our website, you need to take a little peruse there. The, one of the cool things about the member book page is, which we didn't have a feature pr pr prior to Kevin taking over as webmaster, you can put a keyword in the search bar, the name of the author in the search bar, no pop up anything with that keyword search. So if you're looking for your books or other people's books, sometimes if you put in a word and other people's things pop up, it's because there's a keyword search that triggers on their stuff as well. So, you know, it's a, a but it's a great way to find what you're looking for. Um, that being said, I, I know I, I realized that uh, we didn't mention what the annual dues is to be a member of Diamond Valley Writers Guild. It's $25 a year. So for $25 a year, not only do you get a listing on the website, you have a book, but then you get your books with buy links. You get to participate in the anthology we've got coming up, which I'll be speaking about in a few minutes. If you have a book published, we do a shout out to our membership. We have almost 500 people on our mailing list. So they get a shout out that your book is coming out or just came out that month. So we do a lot of things to help promote. And that's really the goal, the YouTube channel, all that kind of stuff we do. On the anthology, things are doing well. Um, Kevin is the person sorting through your submissions. So if you have an opportunity, if you're unfamiliar with what the guidelines are for the um, anthology, let me read that real quick. Hold on. The theme for our anthology is animals. And they can be wild or domestic. They can be beloved pets or rascally pests, even mythical creatures. The animal must be integral to the story or the poem, not merely a cute, cuddly cameo of some sort. Although they need not be the central character, they should inform or be essential to the plot or impact the main character in a meaningful way. Um, 1800 word limit, so it's basically slightly bigger than flash fiction. And uh, you can submit up to two uh, prose and two poems. So if you're a poet and a narrative writer, you can submit up to four pieces if you wish. So the deadline for submission is May 1st. Um, we have guidelines on the website, very detailed guidelines about where to send it, how to, what to put in your subject line. Kevin, like I said, is the one. We have a separate email for that, by the way. So and that is at bvwgsubmissions at gmail.com. So don't send it to the normal Gmail account. And again, you must be a paid member to participate. Good, the good news is, is that we've got enough money in reserve. We'll be able to make this publication happen with potentially not having to go to members asking for more money. Although, if you want to make a donation, we're always, always happy to take that. YouTube, Lynette. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm excited to let you know that all of our past YouTubes in our archives are all up and working. So go out there and if you weren't even a member before, you can still access all those great speakers. Uh, if you had something going on and you missed a meeting, go out there, hit those up. Um, and we are going to now be working on the ones for this year, for 2024. We wanted to make sure we had all the old ones up first so that they were chronologically easier to find. So the other thing I'm doing is for those of you on Zoom, I'm putting the information that everybody's speaking about in our chat. So all the membership information is there. All the web links are there. And as we go through, if, if there's any questions or anything, I'll throw those in the chat so you can access those also. Thank you. How about shout outs and celebrations? Do you have any updates on that? Yeah, I'm really excited about the shout outs and celebrations. Not only do we... Um, celebrate your books that you were published and we do it in reverse or in arrears so anything that you published last month will go out on the shout out at the end of this month 
But if you're having book launches, if you want an award, tell me so that we can put it out there and everybody can celebrate with you. Um, we had some great feedback by one of our members, Karen, who said, what about those who have a monthly blog? So, hey, send me your blog link. I'll be glad to share it with our readership, with our email address, so, so that um, we can get you guys um, your work out there and more people reading and supporting you. An example on the blog situation, that's actually now, I believe, Kevin, correct me if I'm incorrect here, but that is actually linked now to Karen Robertson's profile on the Guild webpage as a member, another member benefit. You can, if you don't have a website as a writer, you can almost use our website and your profile on it as, as your personal link to the world as an author. So is that right, Kevin? Yep, that's right. And actually, um, in the email that uh, you're going to be sending out, out to membership, um, I've actually created a way now that you can actually take a domain name that you own and literally redirect it right into your member profile page. So if you don't have a website, the Diamond Valley Writers Guild can provide you a basic website with links to your books and articles. Hey, great. Lynette Kidlet, um, Critique and Accountability Group. Yeah, I'm really excited about this. I'm a little slow in getting it going, but I want to make sure we get an opportunity for everybody. Um, I think our Kidlet authors have been a little underserved in the past, so we want to correct that. We're going to have a critique and accountability group, so you can either just come and say, yeah, I actually did write this week, or you can bring a piece and we can talk it over. And um, I have about eight people so far that are interested. So this coming week... Um, I will be sending out some information so we can get a time going that uh, everybody can meet. So um, if you're interested, just uh, send an email to the Guild. It'll also be one of the boxes on our membership feedback form for the meeting. Um, I updated that. I'll segue off that a little bit. The feedback form, that the board looks at all your comments. Um, there are a couple places in there that asking for volunteers or interests, and we didn't really have a place for you to put your name. The form has been updated now so that you'll get a little pop-up that asks for your name and your email address so that we can get back to you in response. Because sometimes we get um, feedback and it says, contact me, and y'all didn't put your name on there. <laughs> and since the feedback form is totally anonymous, because we want you to be honest with us, it does not track your email unless you give it to us. So back to Kidlet. Um, we'll be having some more information come out next week on that so we can get going. So I'm really excited about serving those members that write for kids. Thank you, Lynette. It's me again. Um, you're going to get real tired of seeing me. Uh, so we have, as you know, we have the hybrid system and we always need more help with it. So if you want to try to learn a new thing, help us set up. Sometimes we have donuts. So if you like donuts, um, you can always come and help us set up. Um, this is for people within the valley or within driving distance. Sorry, all of you in Canada. Um, it would be a bit of a commute for you to come and help us set up just for a couple hour meeting but we always want more help and if you're wanting to learn something new again if one of us the four of us that are if we get sick or injured or perish unexpectedly though you know the hybrid system will no longer be able to run as smoothly as it does so if you want to learn a new skill hang out with cool people like us please feel free to help volunteer and learn the hybrid system thank you no shortage of modesty amongst the, the guild members apparently um, member successes. Now, I know some people have had some successes. And by the way, if, if you're not a paid member, you can go ahead today if you're a guest and tell us about a recent success. Have you published a book? Have you won an award? It's sort of like the live version of shout out. So let's start with, is there anyone on Zoom who has had a recent su success, um, either since the last meeting or since the last time you were here, and if you've never been here, please share a success with us. We love to hear when authors are, are publishing and getting awards. Anybody? So we have no published authors on Zoom. <laughs> Anybody in the room? I know Manny does. Does Manny want to make an announcement? You have to come to the mic. Come on, Manny. Come on. And you published a book, and it's in the library. Go tell them about your book. We have a first-time attendee. His name is Manny, and I just put him on the spot. 
So he's coming up. He's got to learn how to public speak if he's going to be an author. Actually, um, I public speak quite a bit. It's not one of my... Yeah. I, 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 I've been a writer almost all my life, but I've written technical um, energy publications. I've written for a number of utilities in the state of California. I've been before the Public Utility Commission. And um, I, 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 a lot of that is proprietary information that I can't talk about anymore. Anyway, I did write a book. I've, I, I've written a number of, of books. Um, I don't write one book at a time. I, I don't know how anybody can do that. Right now, I'm writing four. That makes any sense to anybody? Um, but this book just came out in October. It's called Fishing with Ted Williams. And I, uh, for those of you that do or do not know who Ted Williams was, very famous baseball player, considered the best hitter of all time. The book is not a biography. I don't write biographies. I tell stories. Uh, fishing with Ted Williams is not really about fishing, and it's not really about baseball, and I can't really explain what it's about. You're going to have to read the book. I will tell you this. A lot of people don't know this, but Ted Williams was a decorated Marine Corps fighter pilot, and that's a huge clue. Any questions? Go ahead. I'm mental. Oh, uh, what I actually what I believe me to write this book. Um, I love baseball. Uh, I do a lot of fishing. Um, his story, uh, interested me. Um, I never met Ted Williams. And one of the questions that I get all the time from people that have read this is, how did you meet him? How did you know him? I never met him. It's just a story. Hey, Michelle. Thank you, Manny. Yes. We've got one more on Zoom. Oh, excellent. Okay, who is it? Uh, Don Bishop, you want to go ahead? Don, go ahead and un unmute. Oh, Don, can you hear us? Yes, sorry. I, my connection cut out there. I got too far from Wi-Fi. Um, so, really quick about Ted Williams. Uh, I believe the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego has a building named after him. Uh, unless I'm getting my lines crossed, they do. And I was in the band when we did the dedication ceremony of that building, naming it after him. So that was that was a cool experience. It was fun to be there. But um, yeah, I I just uh, launched my first novel uh, about two weeks ago. It's a YA fantasy. Uh, first in the series. Um, I'm, the series is called Nightshade Unicorn, and book one is Forerunner. And I'm excited. I have a few sales already. You know, it's available on Amazon, and I just got the Ingress Park proof copies yesterday, so that's about to be a thing as well once I go in there and, and set those to live. But, um, yeah, it's it's... You know, got got to go save the world, but I I keep it um, family appropriate for anyone who doesn't mind their their kids reading things. Uh, mine is kids safe, but it's not aimed at kids. But, uh, yeah, I'm excited. Congratulations again, getting a book out there. Just writing a book is a huge accomplishment, so it's wonderful to hear about that. If um, anyone who's on Zoom, if you're not on our email list and you want to be for future things, because I don't know if I've ever talked to you, Don, but go ahead and email the Guild and we'll make sure that you have invites for future meetings. Again, you don't have to be a member to participate, only to reap some of the benefits of membership. Any other member successes? Anyone write a story, start a project? Great. Who is it? Hi, it's Tessa Floriano from Seattle. Hello, can you hear me? Tessa. Yeah, hi. We can, yeah, Tessa. Thank you. 
yeah, I just want to share, um, I think I talked about it maybe last year when it came out, my book, my first, my debut nonfiction, Italians in the Pacific Northwest, um, has um, been, uh, let's see, moved up to finalist in the Nellie Bly uh, category, which is um, Journalistic Nonfiction Award at the Chanticleer Conference happening in Bellingham next month. So it's made it up through the shortlist and all of that. So we'll see if we get to, you know, being an actual winner. But also um, the book has um, uh, created some interest with um, a few different groups to make a documentary. <clears throat> Um, so that my book covers the early uh, Italian settlers in Idaho, Oregon, and Washington from 1880 to 1950. So the documentary would cover that, but go beyond 1950. And if that documentary is successful, uh, we will move on to a traveling exhibit. So that all that is in the works. Yeah, thank you. It's a labor of love. No money in it yet. <laughs> But um, a lot of people, including my publisher, uh, had no idea. There's about half a million of us in the tri-state area here. Um, most of the attention goes to Italians east of the Mississippi, but um, Italians in the Pacific Northwest is uh, getting a lot more attention. So I'm happy about that. And my book sort of sparked some of that. So, uh, you know, happy to leave that as a legacy uh, for the people in this area. So we'll see what happens. So I just want to share that. Congratulations. Thank you for Thank sharing. You. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much. Anybody else? Anybody on Zoom who has something recent they want to share? Not seeing anybody on Zoom. Anybody else in the room? No? Has our speaker joined yet? Oh, good. That, that's always heart, heart uh, pounding when, when the speaker isn't on when you start the meeting, so I'm glad she is. We usually have a writing tip or a tech tip at this point, but unfortunately, Brenda Hill, who was scheduled to do that, she wasn't feeling well. So we're going to skip that today, and we're going to be launching right into the speaker. Um, so, so, Sophia, if you want to come up and introduce your speaker. Um, we always love to get recommendations from guild members and participants of different speakers they'd like to hear, and then we can reach out. So the board as a whole are the ones that go and we hunt these people down, and we contact them, and we say, hey, would you come speak for our group? And so Sophia brought our last month's speaker, did a great job. And uh, this month, she's got another speaker that she wrangled for us. So I'm going to let her talk about our speaker. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? All right, good. Um, so the speaker we have for this meeting is uh, Lori Cooper. And it has been absolutely wonderful to speak to her, her over the past several months. Um, She's delightful, and she has quite a bit of experience under her belt because Lori Cooper is an award-winning speaker who launched her online business, Pubcraft, marketing for books and brands, in October 2013. She helps fiction authors go from struggling, feeling invisible, and not knowing what to do next to finding and connecting with their ideal readers. In her first years of business, Lori went from one to over 200 clients and helped 100-plus authors hit the New York Times and USA Today best-selling lists. While she works as a marketing coach with authors from around the world, Lori calls Ottawa, Canada her home. Lori and her course, The Visible Author Method, have allowed hundreds of clients to simplify their marketing efforts, leading to more time to write. And so she's going to talk to us today about um, 10 tips for a successful promo push. So I can't think of a single other person who is more qualified to talk to us today about that. So thank you very much. Take it away, Ms. Lori. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia, for the introduction and also for coordinating with me. And it's a pleasure to be here with the Diamond Valley Writers Guild. I do have a PowerPoint presentation for you today. So I'm going to open that up and then I'm just going to get a quick check that everybody can hear and see and is uh, able to view everything successfully. So can someone just give me a thumbs up or an aggressive nod? Okay, lovely. And, and it, Appreciate it. it. Looks, <laughs> and it looks good in the room as well. Oh, wonderful. Okay. That's fantastic. And if you would, if you would like me to do, um, you know, traffic control on questions, just let me know how you want to handle it as we go along. Okay. Okay. That sounds lovely. I'm sorry. And what's your name? My name is Michelle. 
Michelle, thank you so much. Okay. Well, you know what? I would like to handle questions, if possible, uh, at the end. So I'm going to move through an info-packed presentation. Uh, I will have just a couple questions for you throughout the presentation to get a sense of who I'm speaking to today so I can cater everything a little bit to what everyone's experience is and what they're working on. But when it comes to the live Q&A, let's have a section for that right at the end and then we'll get into everything. Okay, perfect. Let's get started. This is top 10 tips for a successful promo push, and it's intended to help you have your most successful release or backlist revival yet. And since everyone can see the presentation perfectly, I'm just going to move on. Thank you so much again, Sophia, for the introduction. I will move through this as we've already had a chance to chat. I will welcome everyone to join me in my free Facebook group. I offer some free virtual assistance, consulting, and support for anyone who would like to be there. I'll be sure to share links uh, with Michelle and Sophia uh, either throughout the presentation or at the end so they can send them out. But you can find my Facebook group on facebook.com slash groups slash ask pubcraft. And if we don't get to something that you're interested in today, or if you'd like to just appreciate and support that um free consulting, then just hop on there and I would love to chat with you. So for our agenda today, we'll be looking at three sections. We're going to look at pre-release. So what to do in advance of release day or in advance of that promo push day that you are planning. Then release. How do you make the most out of release week for your book? Post-release, after this, now what? This is often where a lot of us fall off and we think, all right, well, maybe I'll resurface when I have something else that I've worked on, depending on the speed with which you write. We have some rapid releasers. And of course, we have those who might take many, many years right, to get a book out. So it depends where you're at in your journey. But what can you be doing to kind of sustain those efforts and to be more effective when you're ready to do the next push? I'm going to say we a lot when I talk about authors, and that's because I pretty hardcore identify with you, having been working with you for over 10 years now, but I'm actually not an author myself. Okay, so before we jump in, I'm curious, and Michelle, it would be lovely if you could get a sense of the room and just throw something into the chat here for me, but how advanced does everyone feel about the promotions? Can you put into the chat on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being you feel like a complete newbie? Uh, and 10 being you feel very advanced, you feel very successful in this regard. How advanced do you feel about your promotions and your ability to promote your books at this point in time? And just let me know what you're thinking. Okay. So All in right. the room. So I'm seeing a mixture. Oh, go ahead. In the room, we have a couple of people who feel very comfortable with their promotional activities and then people that are kind of iffy and then people like me that know nothing. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you. All right. So I'm seeing some twos, one to two, three, five, six, about an eight. Very good. Some pretty new. <laughs> I'm still revising my first book ever. That's fantastic. Two to three. Okay, wonderful. So it looks like we have... Um, a good mix here today, you know, a bunch of people who consider themselves more at the beginner level and then some outliers who feel that they are very savvy. Okay, I will try to uh, to keep that in mind as we move throughout the presentation. There will be some things that we move through very quickly that you'll have to revisit, um, but I believe this is going to be really well suited to who we have here today. Okay, here are our top 10 tips. Here's an overview. And again, an important note here on depth, because we are moving through things really quickly. I feel that I could give a workshop and have given workshops actually on each of these uh, in and of themselves. And we're going to move through all 10 today. So we won't be getting crazy deep into them, but I've pulled out the really salient points that I think are going to serve you the most. Number one is the basics. We're going to go over what you should have in place. And really, we're going to focus on your book here. Two, the elevator pitch. Three, the platform. This is the where am I supposed to be online presence part of it. Four, the cheat sheet. I will have a downloadable tool for you today that will help you get organized. Five, shareable promo content. Six, paid and free online ads and newsletter features. So how are you getting that extra advertising power? Seven, cross promotion arrangements. Eight, blogger material kits. Or you could think about this like press kits, among other things. Nine, reader engagement, connecting with your readership, and 10, discounts and deals. So these are our top 10 tips for today that we'll be covering. Let's start with the pre-release section, and these are all things to make sure you have in order 
before your book is released or before your big promotion. So one is the basics. This is about putting your book's best foot forward. So the first thing here is, of course, ensuring quality with your book, right? Because even if you have the most fabulous marketing, if your book isn't connecting with your readership, if it isn't quality, if there are issues, then you're not going to be able to successfully move people towards sell through and to other books in the series or to looking forward to your next project. So this, of course, is number one. And I caveat that by saying that always one's mental wellness and taking care of yourself is number one. But of course, when we're thinking about our marketing efforts, we're going to look at the book as being number one. When we think about preparing our book, I always suggest that you prepare uh, a title and subtitle that is informative. So we might sometimes feel like we have this fantastic title um, for our book. And then when we start writing to market or we start connecting with our readership, um, we may realize it doesn't actually resonate with our readership. You know, it doesn't come across the same way that we think it does. Now, this isn't so big a deal if it is simply the title, but we need to be defining what we're offering through the subtitle. So I'm not suggesting you cram everything into that title on your cover by any means. But when you're thinking about your subtitle, whether or not it is actually displayed on the cover of your book, I want you to think about how you can demonstrate to your reader through your subtitle what the book is about. Because you have so little time, as we'll get into later in the presentation, to really connect with your readership. So for example, one of the popular formulas that coaches teach for subtitle would be genre plus trope. So if you just think about whatever title you're going to have for your book, you know, for romance authors, sometimes it's just the name of a, of a billionaire, for example, the name, you know, Chase or something, and then they have a billionaire romance. Or for um, science fiction, you know, we might have Ravaged Planet, and then maybe we want to say something about, you know, first contact or colonizing in the subtitle. So how can you better define your book for your reader by using your subtitle? And a good way to think about that is genre plus trope. So for example, let's say it was a um, a mafia romance and it was the name of the main character was the title of the book. The subtitle might be an arranged marriage, dark mafia romance. This goes a long way and you'll notice a lot of people don't actually do this. And that's key. Of course, optimizing your cover. Many of you will have heard this before, but I do not recommend that you design your own cover. Now, there are some exceptions here, right, where someone is a, a designer in their own right. But even then, it's not necessarily the right choice because you're so close to your project. But certainly having a professionally designed cover and further to that, taking a look at the best sellers in your category, in your genre, so that you are aware of what your cover should look like in order to be uh, reasonably shelved next to them. You know, if, if you are writing in the same space as someone else who's a bestseller, then be looking at what they're doing. And of course, not to steal it, but to look at um, what is popular, what's working, right? How can we lurk and learn and, and take the best of what's out there so that we can attract our ideal readers? Blurb and book description. There are so many workshops on how to optimize these. And I know from working with authors that sometimes these are the hardest things to do. You can write a book, but then when it comes to pithy, snappy content and you're trying to really uh, simplify something or pack it into fewer characters, it's like, oh, and you want to face roll a keyboard. So I understand where you're coming from. I know this is a lot of work, but it is very useful. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that can serve you as well here today. So optimizing your, your blurb and your book description so that you're making it clear to your reader uh, what they are getting. And what I like to say here is remember that um, it's not a summary. It's not a synopsis of, of what you're offering uh, to your reader, but more of a description of what, what they are going to experience from the story, right? So we'll talk a little bit about how to do this. Reviews and editorial reviews. Of course, we don't have time to dig into a big workshop on how you can do this, but setting up some reviews in advance for your book, whether that's through friends or beta readers or access to review teams, this is something that can serve you so well during a release to get that uh, kind of social proof, so to speak, on a retailer. And also on Amazon, 
you have the opportunity to post your own editorial reviews through Amazon Author Central. So that's something to look at. And if you take a look at a lot of best-selling authors and their product listings on Amazon, you'll see that many of them include editorial reviews. And it doesn't necessarily even have to be if you're writing a series, for example, about your newest book, because maybe you don't have them yet. But you might see, for example, that someone says in the front flap of a print copy or on an Amazon product page, praise for, and then the name of the series, and then they may have pulled out previous reviews. So for those of you who have series available, you can utilize those. And then when we think about product page optimization, there isn't as much customization available for those authors who are wide, so are available on many online retailers. But for those who are on Amazon or even exclusive to Amazon, we have much more opportunity for product page customization, so where your book is listed. Uh, and we can make sure our categories are correct, the three categories we have available. I'll share a link about that so you can watch a video from Kindle Printer's Dave Chesson on how to select your best three categories in 2023 now that that's changed. And also thinking about any metadata we have, what keywords we're using, again, back to the title, subtitle, and then also A plus content. So you're able to design through different um, tools like Canva or Bookbrush, which are very popular content and images that could also go on your product page. And whether you are traditional or hybrid or self-published, these are available to you. So don't think it because you're with a traditional publisher that you don't have access to this because you absolutely do. Some things you have to go through your editor and your publisher and other people on your publicity team in order to get done. But many of this, you can take the initiative yourself. So don't think if you're traditional that you're going to be limited here because there's so much that you can do. And I try to make sure that what I do offer applies to uh, anyone's situation. Okay, the elevator pitch. This originally came from when many of us were attending conference and the idea would be that you'd end up in an elevator with the editor that you really wanted to speak to and you know, your heart's being really fast, like, oh my God, and they ask what your book is about. Yeah, so panic ensues. This is where you want to be prepared in advance so that you can sell someone on your book in 30 seconds or less. That's where the elevator pitch idea kind of came from. Post-pandemic, and because so often now we are doing mostly digital marketing, I am going to encourage you to think about this kind of like three-second social, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. But essentially what this requires is for you to understand your book deeply. So making sure you've done the thinking in advance so that you can communicate the value of your book and why it would appeal to your ideal reader. I like to think about this as answering three questions. And the three questions we answer, we do everywhere. You're anywhere on your online presence, anywhere you're front facing, whether it's in person or digital, like at a conference trade show or on social media, for example, any place that uh, a reader, a potential reader might land and interact with you and your brand, be answering, one, what can they expect? Two, why should they care? What makes it, it special? What makes it special? And three, what should they do next? And what should they do next is really just instructions. It's just a call to action. It can be click here, read now, sign up for my newsletter list to hear more but always offer an action. And you'd be surprised because just statistically having that third option where you say, hey, this is what you do next. Many people miss that. They come up with great content and they put it out there and they might think it's obvious what the potential reader should do next, but actually leading them down the garden path is going to make a massive difference to your efforts. So again, what should they expect? Why should they care? Or what makes it special? And um, what should they do next? Expect special next. An exercise to help you with this is to distill your story down to main themes. So think about questions that are being asked, character struggles, features and tropes, and try to do this in max five sentences. And I know some people are thinking, well, you're crazy, <laughs> but you can do it. So max five sentences, and this will help so much later with copy when you're preparing for advertising, the three second social piece we're about to talk about, and then also booking online advertising. And of course, keep everything that you are doing, everything that you're writing as you work on this, because you'll come back to it and it will be useful. So again, another question for everyone here today. Do you think you could communicate your brand? in three seconds or less, or maybe you're not even sure what you would define as your brand. But let me know, yes or no, do you think you could communicate your brand in three seconds or less? And please put it in the chat. I'll just give a second to see some. <laughs> I guess, yes, no, I see some screaming. <laughs> no. 
Okay. And I see Michelle's getting a sense of the room for me here. Okay. We've got about three people in the room nodding. Some people doing, you know, yes and no kind of with the hand motion and other ones that are just staring blankly at the screen. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So sounds about right. Sounds about right. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you as much as I can today, and I'm happy to help you more later, anytime. So when we think about three-second social, um, in 2019, Forbes reported that people had an attention span of eight seconds. So that's down from 12 seconds back in the early aughts. And now many mobile users are said to have an attention span of three seconds. So this affects content marketing, of course, everything that you're posting and how much time you have to get your message across to your potential reader. The goal of Three Second Social is to communicate your value, the value behind your brand, the value behind uh, your book to your prospective reader in three seconds or less. So questions every single time someone interacts with content of yours, whether it's a, even just a view, are they getting that quickly an impression from your writing and from your imagery, what your book is about? So if we want to magnetize our ideal reader to us and actually keep them from abandoning and scrolling and just moving on, how can we critically look at our content and assess how it's doing that? So of course, there are going to be many puzzle pieces that fit into that, but thinking about three second social is going to serve you immensely. And I do encourage you to go and audit your online presence and look and say, uh oh, <laughs> got some skeletons in the closet there or some dust that needs to be cleared out because often we had an idea and we did some work and then we never really went back and updated it to be truly representative of what we're offering. And just to make brand really snackable, since we can't do a brand workshop today, although I'd be happy to do one for you in the future, brand you can think about simply as your promise to and relationship with your reader. So if you think of it as nothing else, think about it as your promise to and relationship with your reader. And how are you communicating that? If you were starting any friendship or any romance with someone, how would you want to come on it first, for example? How do you want them to perceive you and then move forward from there? Okay, so the platform, this is your online presence. And so often I'm asked, hey, Lori, where am I supposed to be? There's so much to do. It's exhausting. Maybe social media has been... Um, something that is avoided for you because you're not super comfortable with it or you don't feel really tech savvy or maybe it just feels like a waste of time or, you know, toxic and the trolls abound or maybe you love it, right? We have some people who actually really, truly enjoy this. Although I know many authors that I speak to would rather do less, not more. But I must often, where am I supposed to be? And I think the question to be asked here is where are my readers? So being reader centric is the most important. And I don't believe you should be everywhere. I'm not of the school of thought that you should try and do everything because as much as that might make you more discoverable in some ways, because you might show up more in a search, for example, it's not necessarily serving you. And the more that you do, the more you can dilute your messaging because you're not able to really focus on a few pillars. So think about where you want to be and what serves you and whether your readers are there. And then I'd say subtract rather than add. Focus on a few places in particular. Now, I always encourage your newsletter. Number one, that's your best asset, all right, because you, you own it, so to speak. Social media, you can build up a really big following. And if there's a blackout or something is no longer going to be offered, or if your account gets hacked or whatever goes wrong, you might have invested a lot of money, just time and resources into something where you no longer have access, where your newsletter, your list is something that you can export and take with you. And you have a direct line of contact to your readership. So growing your newsletter is number one. I also encourage authors to have a book club account, to be on Goodreads. Uh, and to keep their Amazon author profile updated, since most often we do see people using Amazon in addition to other retailers, but Amazon is the big one. So when it comes to your brand and online platform, consider where you want to be and try to be visible and discoverable even if your book isn't ready for sale. So you can think about your brand voice and what you want to communicate, even if you don't necessarily have something available. Where you want to be leading people at that point is to sign up for a newsletter or to get in touch with you so that you can let them know when you have more content available. And this can be really easy to do through something like MailerLite, MailerLite.com, for example, because it's free to start. It's free at 
to 1,000 subscribers, and you can build a custom landing page using their tools. They have 24-hour live chat support, and you're able to create something that gives you that call to action, those instructions for people to follow through so that your content pays off for you. And I want to say when it comes to social media, for example, I don't use X anymore. I have it. I used to use Twitter. But now I just have a post, a tweet pinned to the top of the page that says, hey, you found my Twitter profile. Well, I'm not often on Twitter. You can find me on my Facebook group here. And I link to Facebook. So if you do have something, don't be afraid so much about leaving it dormant. Think about it like a billboard, right? You're driving down the road and you see a sign and you get that top of mind awareness, for example, and just have something there that's highly representative of what it is that you're offering. Again, assess it with three second social, but then lead them elsewhere when you're answering those three questions. Lead them to where they can interact with you, whether it's a newsletter or a blog or Instagram or Facebook or Discord, wherever it is that you like to connect with your readership. And again, you're allowed to be choosy here. You do not have to do everything. Certainly, there are points when we start to examine our market and we go, hey, I need to be strategic. And as much as I really hate Facebook, I know my readership is there, so I'm going to use it. That's bound to happen at some point. But think about where your pillars ought to be and where your readership is and do the necessary research to discover what that is. The cheat sheet. Okay, this is everything that you need ready in one place. So when I worked as a virtual assistant, which I did for the beginning of my career, and I worked with many, many romance authors, and we were gunning to hit lists like the New York Times and USA Today, and I would find that I'd be working with, let's say, 10 authors in a box set, and I'd be helping them get organized so that we could plan a really strategic promo stack or a really strategic push during one week of promotion. And getting all of this organized and getting everyone's links together could be kind of a a web, a little bit of a disaster. So we came up with the cheat sheet and I would have everyone participating fill this out. And it would include their book's general info, like for instance, a synopsis, uh, the blurb, any tropes or categories they felt the book fit in, maybe some um, popular reviews if they already had something like that, the author's general info, so name or pseudonym, uh, their email, and uh, links, social media links, also the book buy links. So perhaps they had a universal link through something like bookstreet.com or they were on Amazon or they're also on Barnes and Noble, Apple, Google Play, Kobo, wherever. But I was sure to have that as well as any of their links like BookBub, Goodreads, Facebook, etc. This made it so easy to book promotion for them. So when I wanted to purchase paid ads online and I needed to put in this information, I had it all at my fingertips. So I always suggest now that when anyone is planning a promotion, they fill this up for themselves. So I'm going to give you a link to this template for the cheat sheet and then everyone, and they can send it around after as well in case anybody doesn't get it. I was talking to Sophia about that earlier, but anyone can use this and start to make sure they have it all organized. It just helps you to plan your promotion, and make things much simpler. Okay, let's move into talking about release. So during your release week or wherever you're going to have your promo push, this is what you need uh, ready for that and then what you're going to be doing during that time. So, of course, shareable promo content. This would be a folder of promotional images, a copy of taglines, your Facebook banner, maybe you're changing your newsletter banner at the time. Maybe you have Instagram content or short form video or anything you're going to be sharing about your book. Some of these things are called, for example, in romance, especially in steamy romance, you might see it called man candy or in other places, quote cards. Um, but it's where you might have a, an image that is appropriate to the book, whether it's through stock art or whether it's, you know, repurposing your cover art. And usually some conversational content from the story, a, a little excerpt, or uh, sometimes it'll just be kind of an enticing tagline or a piece of copy in order to excite your reader and get them interested in what it is that you're offering. So have these available so that you've made it easy for yourself to post. If we make it to release day or we make it to the promo push date and we don't have anything designed and ready life happens and you're not always really raring to go on that day. You know, maybe you haven't had the optimal amount of caffeine and everything just kind of falls flat or takes forever or something happens, but having it all ready in advance means you can either schedule that content or you can easily share it. 
And it also makes it possible for you to share it with others who can support you, like your writing community, for example, who might be willing to share in their newsletters or might be willing to share on their social media to celebrate your release and your discount or your promotion as well. So this is also where having that short and snappy pre-written sales copy comes in. So earlier, when I was talking about the exercise of distilling your book down into those five sentences, looking at struggles and questions and tropes and features and that kind of thing, this is where that's going to come in really handy as well. Because sometimes you'll go about booking an online ad and you'll say, okay, I'm ready. I can copy and paste everything from my cheat sheet. I have everything available. And then they say, don't paste your description from Amazon. Just write a new book description that's 150 characters or 300 characters long. You're like, okay, that's awful. That might sometimes be a roadblock that lasts more than 24 hours. I've seen it happen. So having this available is going to make it a lot simpler for you to book ads with ease and to make sure that everything is organized. And just some resources to help you out today. If you would like to be creating banners and visuals to share, or maybe even 3D versions of your book, you know, where you'll see someone have their flat cover, but then you'll see it propped up really nicely in a, in a photograph, for example, on, on social media where they have it on a tablet or on a, a mobile device, or they have a 3D print copy, it looks like. You can do that through um, doityourselfbookcovers.com slash 3D mockups, which I have here on the slide. And you can just upload your book cover and then download any of those templates for free. It's excellent and it won't cost you anything. So that's a way that you can help yourself make those nice images. And you can also do this kind of thing through Canva, Fiverr, BookBrush. Another great site is remove.bg, which allows you to remove the background from an image. So maybe you have something that you want, but it has, let's say, a starship in the front and you don't want the space background. You can have that removed so that you have the starship element available to put on some imagery. We won't get into licensing today, but I'll just say, hey, make sure you're using images that are free for commercial purposes, free for use in that sense, or that you've paid for when you're going to be editing them and using them for selling. So having banners and visuals to share, this is great. I'm often asked about authors feeling salesy or like they don't want to promote themselves or they're nervous about saying, buy my book, buy my book. And of course, there are more smooth ways to suggest or entice someone to buy your book than saying buy my book of course and then we all know this but I think a lot of it more requires a reframe so if you think about what you're offering to your reader and if you really understand what your reader wants it feels much better to talk about your book and to talk about what it what 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 is special about it or what appeal it holds for your reader? Because then it reframes what you're doing into almost an act of generosity, a helpful thing, rather than something where you're just saying, here, I want you, I want you to purchase. So for example, if you're ever looking for the answer to a question, or maybe you're feeling some kind of anxiety of some kind for whatever reason, or you're out and you really need to know um, what I'm thinking of random things here. You're trying to get a stain out of something and you're thinking, what's the best stain remover that I can make that's all natural at home? All right. And you pull out your phone or you get to a computer and you look this up and you find the answer on a forum, on Reddit, on a blog, wherever, right? You get the answer, you're happy and you move on because something has solved your problem. So information is available to you that has made your life simpler and better. So think about this in the sense of a reader. There are voracious readers, right? Some people read so many books. I have so many reviewers I know who read multiple books. You know, they're going to read like one to two a day. And then I have lots of readers who read a lot less. But when they're looking for something, they know what they want. So if you're on Netflix, for example, right, and you're looking for movies, it's going to make those recommendations to you. Or if you're on Amazon, it's going to make those personalized recommendations to you. You have your own profile about what it is that you like. So how can you communicate to your potential reader that this is something they're going to like? And that requires you to niche down and really know what it is about your book that is so likable and who the audience is. Being specific is better. It is better to be something than to be so broad and generalized that then you're nothing. There's no top of mind connection. Nobody thinks this person equals this. You know, this person offers inspirational, tender, romantic happily ever afters. This person offers, you know, galactic empire space adventures with really fascinating sidekicks. This person offers um, 
you know, break your heart material that leaves you in tears, but also dying to read the next one because it was so meaningful, right? So think about what is the special thing about your book or your writing that you're offering and make sure that's clear. And when you're communicating that, it becomes much more helpful to someone rather than feeling salesy. And even if sometimes it does tend towards salesy, if there was ever a time to be salesy, it's during your main promotion week. So when you have a new release come out, because that's a time where you get to celebrate your wins and you invite your community to do that with you as well. So I would encourage you not to be afraid of that and to try to reframe it as something that is really helpful and people are looking for it. So you're just making sure that you are shining a light on what it is that they're looking for so that it's easier for them to find. And then, of course, character copy. Here's my hot tip for you. When you are writing your um, copy and you're trying to come up with condensing your synopsis or condensing your blurb or anything like that into more pithy statements and snappy marketing statements, keep everything. So even if you think, oh, man, that was terrible or that paragraph I wrote was awful, keep it. Keep it all. You can keep um, kind of a hot sheet of what is the best, what you think is the most appealing. But the reason it's wonderful to have the rest is sometimes we look at it and we think, oh, that's awful. And then we come back a little while later and we go, hey, that wasn't so bad. This part's actually really useful. Or this really resonated with my reader. And the only way to know, to truly know, unfortunately, is trial and error. We can study best practices and we can take the best advice that's out there and rely also on the wisdom uh, of our writing community and those who have achieved it. But ultimately, there isn't a one size fits all. And you're going to have to find a repeatable system for you that works and your books are unique to you. So we need to figure out what it is that it appeals and resonates with your reader. And sometimes it's not what you think it is. Sometimes where you belong in the space isn't what you initially thought it was. So how can we not have you um, take away from the work and the thinking you've already done? And this is where I say, just save a copy to your computer or to Google Drive or OneDrive or Dropbox or whatever it is that you use to organize your files and just call it character copy. And it's just, hey, this is all my ideas and so many different characters so that I can repurpose it again later. It's extremely helpful. So six, paid and free ads and newsletter features. So booking the right online ads and newsletter features and right here is in air quotes because um, how do you know, right? How do you know what's going to be the most effective or what's going to be uh, the, the best for you, not only on return on investment, but also reaching your ideal readership? So we're going to talk about that in just a moment. The spreadsheet, which I'm going to show you an example of, I encourage my authors to use a spreadsheet to track what it is they're booking. And this is in an effort to... Um, create that repeatable system for yourself. So for instance, if you go to all this work of choosing a bunch of sites in particular that you want to promote your book on, or social media platforms, or cross promotion arrangements, but then you don't track what it is you did, maybe you have a fabulous release or fabulous promotion, but then you go back and unfortunately, the biggest line that we tell ourselves is, I'll remember, (laughs) right? No, write it down. (laughs) Don't assume you're going to remember. So if you can track it in the spreadsheet, then that is going to be really helpful for you because we are going to work toward your repeatable system. It's not anybody else's. There will be things that resonate across multiple authors, but it's what worked for you and your book because that way, each time you have a successive marketing plan or another book to promote or some other content to share, you know what worked for you previously. So then you're working towards the thing instead of starting from scratch every time. And I'll show you the template for the spreadsheet in just a moment. So when it comes to booking the right online ads and newsletter features, and just for those who maybe aren't aware, I'm going to distinguish between the two. An ad, for example, we all know what an advertisement is, but there are many different types of ads. Cost per click ads, for example, like the Facebook ones you might click on or BookBub or Amazon advertising. But then there are also sidebar ads on websites or, you know, banners you can purchase or, um, gosh, I'm trying to think any images where you would appear online with a link so that someone could click that, right? And then, of course, there are newsletter features, which is often what a lot of authors will be using. So, for example, let's say you book a feature through Fussy Librarian, fussylibrarian.com, and you are told you're going to go out in your Tuesday newsletter to all their readers. Then this would be a newsletter feature. So they're going to be including your book in their newsletter that's going to the curated audience. So what's the most important thing here? Well, newsletter features tend to work 
the best across the board for authors because you are you have access. You're paying for access to a community of potentially ideal readers. And the more you niche down, the more successful this will be for you. And then cost per click ads is usually something that's more advanced. So those who said, I feel eight or I feel 10 or I feel nine or whatever about your promotions, you're probably familiar with cost per click ads and have probably ventured into Facebook advertising and Amazon advertising and the like, and may even be in coaching programs related to those because they are um, a whole ecosystem unto themselves. But for those who are looking to try out a couple things, see if they can build their audience a bit more, really want to promo stack, so book a bunch of features together to try and boost their visibility, you're going to be mainly booking newsletter features. And we'll, I'm going to list a couple options that I like for where you can purchase these to get started. And the most important thing here is that you niche down. You know, sometimes we get contacted on social media or cold emails from those scammy promoters. <laughs> and unfortunately, there are many of them out there. But sometimes we'll also see a legitimate promoter, for example, offering things like, you know, for X amount of money, I will blast your book out to a million readers or I'll blast your book out to a, a million people. We don't want this because maybe it sounds great to paper the town, but A, we don't know if they're actually readers. B, we don't know if they're readers of our genre, right? That's not going to serve us. If you send out, you know, for example, and really... A uh, sexy book, a really romantic and steamy book out to a bunch of, um, you know, sweet mail order bride romance fans, they're not going to appreciate it at all, right? Or if you have a, a thriller and you send them uh, an inspirational women's fiction when they're looking to read some kind of dark thriller, again, you're doing yourself a disservice and you're wasting your money and time in the process. So always being sure to niche down as much as possible. And on sites, for example, like Fussy Librarian, like Free Booksy or Bargain Booksy, like eReader News Today and some of the others we're going to talk about, you have the option to effectively niche down as long as you understand what it is you're offering. So you can select a certain type of romance or you can select a certain type of mystery or thriller or whatever it is that you're offering. So I'm going to encourage you to always make your own list and create that repeatable system and figure out what works for you. So again, some favorites, Fussy Librarian, Book Rebel, Book Cave, ENT or eReader News Today, Free Booksy, Bargain Booksy if your book is discounted. These are some great sites to note that are pretty effective and ones that you could test out, especially depending on where you are in your, in your journey. They'll be ones that you would use at the beginning and also when you're in the really advanced uh, stages of your, of your marketing efforts. So here's a look at the spreadsheet. I like to create one on Google Sheets. So I use Google Drive a lot because it's free and I'm a Gmail user among other things. So I like to just create one through Google Sheets. However, you could do this in Excel, you could do it anywhere, you could create your own folder. So I suggest having a table that has the site. So Fussy Librarian, for example, the link, fussylibrarian.com, the contact if you have one, maybe there won't be anybody. The feature, you know, maybe you decided to do a primary genre and a secondary genre promotion. And you put one in, um, one in like romance, contemporary, and you put the other one in steamy romance, for example. Okay. Let's just, in case you were a steamy romance author, which honestly many of my clients are because I started off exclusively in romance before expanding to all fiction authors. And then the dates, this would be the date your promotion is going to go live. And you might include pricing of the feature as well. So maybe you spent $17 on the primary genre and $21 on the secondary genre. And then the dates it's going to happen. And the notes are for extra details of the feature and also tracking how it performed. So in whatever way you're able to, since, for example, traditionals, unlike self-pubbed, they can't see their sales right away. They might have a delay, like a quarterly delay on when they're seeing their royalty statement. So they may not be able to respond and pivot really quickly to how effective something is, but they're going to know down the line. Whereas you self-published authors, you can madly hit refresh, right? And look at your dashboard and look at your sales rank and really see, hey, how effective is this uh, in what I'm trying to achieve? Where are the indicators for return on investment? And those might not just be sales or royalties. Those could also be, did I get more followers? Did I get more likes, for example? Although I personally don't place much importance on social proof, like likes and followers. I would be looking at something like increase in subscribers, more reviews, um, downloads, um, even if the royalties aren't necessarily reflecting 
the sales that you want to see, these are indicators that your book is getting in the hands of readers, which is what we're looking for, right? And then we build on that. And then I like to keep tabs like free to book, bargain books. So free to book would be, for example, if you go to awesomegang.com, they have a whole tab of free advertising options. So if you're feeling like it's really limited, the budget that you have available right now, you could look at some of those free options and try them, for example, and it'll give you some really good experience as well because there are free written interview options that you could try. Save your content. Anything you reply in written interview, save it. It will be gold for you later. Bargain books. This is anything from uh, basically 99 cents to 2.99, sometimes 5.99 if that's still 50% off of your book. Um, although that's rare, but bargain books, there are so many sites that will feature your bargain book, but not many that feature regularly priced books. So again, self-published authors, and especially those who are exclusive to Amazon and KU, they have a real opportunity to do lots of discounts because for those who are experienced with it, you get those five days every 90 day period where you can do a Kindle countdown or change the price. So you have a real opportunity to do pushes with your books. Whereas those that are traditional, they're either kind of at the whim of whenever your traditional publisher is like, oh, it's 99 cents, or you happen to notice that your book's one ninety nine one day. Nobody told you, for example, um, or you're able to coordinate if you have a nice relationship with your team, in which case you could actually organize having a discount. Blogs and review options. So you might have something like uh, a blogger you happen to connect with at a conference or someone that you know through a friend or... Uh, that was recommended to you that you want to reach out to uh, regularly for your promotion. So make sure you have those listed as well. And then maybe review sites like booksirens.com or Booksprout or Hidden Gems or other places, self-publishing review where you might want to plan promotions. So I like to keep a spreadsheet of my resources, but I also like to keep a spreadsheet of what worked and what I tried for my promotions so that I know if I want to repeat them in the future. So I usually have options like that listed, and then I might have a book promo calendar, which is essentially just the spreadsheet that tracks that particular promotion that I'm on. And it might sound like a lot of work, but being successful as an author is a hell of a lot of work. So these are some tools to put in place so that you can start to build a repeatable system for yourself. And even if it's a slow burn, start to see that traction, because when you start to get wins, it's so rewarding. It gives you a lot. And it's very encouraging and just overall much more fun. Okay, cross promo arrangements. So the question here is, who else other than you can talk about your book during its release week and also would want to? Many of us, when we're starting out, it's like, well, my mom, my sister, my cousin, my friend, right? And that there's nothing to be knocked about that. That's fantastic. That's how you start. That's the beginning of the community. The thing is, they may not be your ideal readership. Sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not at all, not even close. So we do want to build up our ideal readers, but having more super fans or people that support you is its never a bad thing. So when we think about where we would want to do some cross-promotion, which is essentially just doing promotion with another author or with another group of authors or another merchandiser or blogger who also writes appropriate content, anyone who would operate within your space, then we have a couple of options. One of the most popular ones is newsletter swaps. So you can either make it really organic and simple, for example, like let's say in this writing community, you go to a regular meeting and then you say, hey, or maybe you're talking about your author's successes, like I heard some of when I was first joining the call. And you say, I have a, I have a new release coming out and it is... Um, a science fiction galactic empire thing and you talk about it and then you say well are there any other science fiction authors here who think that they also write something similar i'd love to talk and have a conversation about whether i could feature yours in my newsletter and on my social media and maybe you would do the same for me and that's the premise of it is being able to reach a wider audience by sharing content wider and returning the favor with someone else. So a newsletter swap would be featuring that in your newsletter, their cover, their blurb, a link to their where it can be purchased, their buy link and taking advantage of that and sharing with each other so you can all lift each other up. And then bloggers, readers, super fans. These are also people who might want to share it. Now, if you don't have any super fans yet, don't worry. They're coming. Um, but it's wonderful when you do, because those loyal readers often offer to do things for you or are really happy to review or to join a review team that you're creating yourself, or even just to repost and reshare on social media. 
And what's wonderful is no matter how much marketing you do, nothing really ever beats word of mouth. Because statistically, someone getting a recommendation from someone they know, they're far more likely to try it than any other thing they see, whether it's a discount or whether it's just really appealing to them. When your friend or someone you trust says, oh, I watched this and it was great. I read this and I loved it. And they start talking to you about it. That is super effective. So them sharing with their community is something to be encouraged. And again, when you're doing cross promotion, um, it's also good to reach out to bloggers. Now, this isn't as popular as it once was, but you definitely do have an opportunity to um, connect with bloggers on social media and through your writing community and all kinds of Facebook groups and things like that as well. So people who have online communities essentially is how to think about it. And sometimes you can even organize a by donation only or a free book tour for those who are interested. Although I will say book tours, as I'm often asked, are less to me about sales and more about visibility. So it's very good when you're getting started to get your name out, but I'm not a big fan of book tours for the purpose of increasing sales. They're good for reviews and for increased visibility. Sales, I go with the ads and features that we've been discussing and then building up that loyal readership. But think about how you can best be prepared to do cross promo arrangements so that you can have those executed during your uh, release week. And then blogger material kits. This is really just the equivalent of a, a press kit, for example. So for this, I say, remember to kiss, keep it simple, silly. This doesn't have to be something really uh, involved and have a big press release and pay a lot of money or thousands of dollars to some sort of, you know, public relations agency to do this for you. Leave that to when you if, even if you're going to use it, leave that till later. And those who um, are using those things successfully are usually further down the line and are very clearly positioned in the market and they have a very clear goal of who they're trying to target. What I would say is create something yourself or with the help of an assistant or um, something like Canva or Fiverr or that kind of thing that includes those promotional graphics, that includes the content, the copy you've written, and has the cheat sheet, has your cover, has... This all of the things that we've talked about that make you prepared for release week and then keep that together in a folder. So this empowers you to boost your cross promo efforts. But then also you have all of this material available so that if you do end up in contact with anybody who's willing to share, for example, someone in your writing community and they say, oh, OK, well, you know, send me the cover and I'll post it or send me a graphic and I'll post it. You're not going, oh, a graphic. Hmm. I should have one of those available and I don't yet, right? You have it ready so that you can take them up on the moment and send it to them. And if you think about someone asking you to do something for them, you know, for instance, vote online for me, I'm in this contest or, you know, please share this or pick this up from the store, anything other than the fact that they might be family and you love them. So you're going to do it whether you want to or not, unless somebody makes it really simple for you, it's very easy to just not do it. That's often the way that it is. So make something as simple as possible, not only for yourself, but for others. And if you send around an email to your readership and say, hey, um, you know, bonus points for anybody who's going to be sharing this on their social media, here's a graphic and here's the link and the post to copy and paste. You are far more likely to get results with that than you are with saying like, oh, could someone post about this? They have to come up with it all themselves. That won't be helpful. It'll probably not happen. And if it does, you know, praise to that person because they're doing a lot of the work for you. So make it really simple. Post-release. So this is ongoing marketing to keep your backlist selling and make sure readers stay interested in what's coming next. Often we fall off post-release or post-promotion. So nine is reader engagement. And here I say, maybe don't only surface for a new release or when you have promotion. It's all too easy to just kind of slip back into the writing cave or slip back into our demanding lives and not continue to foster reader engagement. But this doesn't have to be something that's really arduous or takes a long time. We want to keep steady, consistent contact with our readers so that we can strengthen our brand and platform and then also lessen our release workload. For example, when I say do an online audit of your presence and see if you're meeting the requirements of three second social, for example, some of you might be thinking, oh, no, <laughs> I haven't updated my online presence in forever. And it still says that, you know, I write something completely different than what I write now, or I know it's not effective, or I know that it's something I'm avoiding. If we keep those things maintained, then the next time we're doing a promotion, it's not like we have this massive workload we're taking on. You know, we can focus on this new thing that we're really excited about. And we know that all the other systems we've put in place for ourselves are working. Like, for example, 
uh, having a reader magnet and a sign up page and something that is truly working, you know, not, so, not dead links or anything that's broken. We know that it conveys to the reader what they're going to get and we have a way to stay in contact with them so that we can keep building on this. And what this means and doesn't mean is important to consider. Again, I'm not saying you have to do everything or depending on your, your lifestyle that you need to be present everywhere. I think you need to define a few ways in which you can keep steady and consistent contact. A system for yourself that allows you to keep things updated, allows you to have some touch points so you can continue to test and see what works and stay connected to your work and your readership, and then make an effort toward that. So for example, because it's really nice when somebody gives you a template, let's say you try and send your newsletter once a month. Okay. And of course, there's so many newsletter strategies, but start there. Okay. And then let's say you, um, you are thinking, well, how many times should I be, should I be posting a month? It's going to be different. It's going to depend on whether you're working in algorithm. It's going to depend on your audience. And this comes back to being reader centric. So I'm going to say, if you really feel lost, then try a newsletter a month and try two marketing events a month. And an event might be you posting or you doing a written interview or you trying a free feature or you booking an ad or doing a really special newsletter or something. Just think of opportunities for you to stay in contact and give you a chance to start testing and staying visible and discoverable even when you're not in the midst of a big promotion. And of course, this will scale with you as you grow. So this is about managing expectations, yours and those of your readers. For example, a way in which I managed expectations was posting to X that I'm not there, but you can find me elsewhere. You know, you think about when you're standing in line waiting for something and it's driving you nuts because you want to be elsewhere. But then if someone has a clock on the wall that counts down or tells you what number you're at, right? that suddenly manages your expectations. So standing in line becomes not so bad because you're like, okay, I know it's an average of a 30 minute wait, or I know that I'm number 62 and they're at number 50 right now. So these are managing expectations that allow the receiver of whatever content you're sharing to know what's coming next. So you don't have to be present all the time. You just need to make good on your promise to your reader. So for example, if you only send out a periodic newsletter, no problem. That may change in the future, but that's what it is right now. And if you don't post really regularly, but you are really present and you engage with your readership during certain times, that's potentially okay too. But you want to manage expectations for your readers so they know what they're getting and you're always showing them what they can expect. And also for yourself, because often creatives are too hard on themselves and suffer from imposter syndrome. And having something that you feel is doable for you that you can then scale is going to serve your mental wellness as well. And then focus on that copy and magnetizing your tribe and truly figuring out what it is that makes your book special and why someone should read it over somebody else in the same space. That's uh, an emotional labor. <laughs> it takes a lot of work, but is so powerful for your marketing and for your messaging and for really connecting with your readership. So pick a schedule that works for you. I'm not a big believer in one size fits all. And finally, number 10, discounts and deals. So we're going to talk about the power of discounting your books. Now, sometimes I hear from authors, I don't want to discount my book. Um, I worked really hard on this, or I feel really strongly. And this is this is art or it's something that I'm really invested in. And why should I discount it? And I can appreciate where you're coming from. But at the same time, when we're putting our marketing hat on, Discounts are so very effective in reaching your readership and in connecting with new potential buyers. For example, and I know that this kind of productizes your, your book rather than maybe looking at it as something that you feel more connected to, but that's required when we're looking at the marketing side of things. Let's say that you always go to a big box store and you always buy the same laundry detergent, right? There's no reason for you to not keep doing that. You're going to keep buying the same one and the same one and the same one unless something stops working, right? Or something incentivizes you to try something else. But if someone gives you a sample while you're out and is like, oh, well, have you tried the lavender kind or have you tried this kind or this one's 50% off, then that's a reason 
for you to try something different. And it has a certain degree of urgency that entices you to actually make that change because we become creatures of habit. So if something isn't being made available for people to try and to get a taste of so that they can get hooked, then we're not serving ourselves. So this is a way for you to get your book into the hands of more readers so that you can build up your loyal readership following. And I highly encourage discounting as a strategy and the promo stacking that goes with it, as well as freebie promotions. They are so very effective in gaining subscribers, in getting your book discoverable and visible, and truly in converting strangers into readers and then loyal readers and then potentially super fans. But that's why we ensure quality of our book first and that it does connect with our ideal readership because you can spend all the money in the world trying to get your book into people's hands, but if they read it and don't like it or it's not suited to them, then again, waste of time and money. So discounts and deals, extremely effective. Now, where authors make the most amount of money typically is through sell through. So even though you may have a bunch of standalone books and not necessarily series, although series are very lucrative, your standalone books and the more books you have in your portfolio, the more potential you have for making money from your sales, right? And then it makes more sense to have something like a loss leader or a free book because people can move through to purchase other things in your portfolio. So how are you encouraging sell through is something to consider as well. Now, maybe that's a product page optimization thing, like making sure that they're available in a series page and that it lead, one leads to the next. But more often than not, because we don't necessarily have a whole series done when we're ready to publish book one, right? More often than not, it has to do with the back matter. So back matter is just when you get to the end of the book, digital or print, you have that section at the end of the book that says where they can find you online. Like your website maybe has a call to action that says, are you interested in reviewing my book? Send me an email here. Or um, make sure you sign up for my newsletter so that you can hear news of my upcoming releases and receive giveaways and uh, excerpts and exclusive content for my super fans, right? So make sure you have that call to action in your book that allows people to stay in touch with you so that, again, you're not starting from scratch every time and that you can let them know what's next so that you get more sell through in the future and you continue to nurture that community. Okay, in review, because I know we looked at a lot of content today rather quickly, the top 10 tips break down into three sections, pre-release, release, and post-release. Pre-release is what to do in advance of release day. Release is how we're making the most out of release week. And post-release is that section for after the release, what now, so that I'm best prepared to deliver successfully on my next promotion. This is Petunia the Promo Pig. She's a mascot in a lot of the content that I post. And she believes you can do it, although I know it's a lot of work. Now, if you found today's webinar helpful and you have additional questions or you would like some support in executing these tasks, again, I'm a coach. I'd love to work with you or chat with you to see if we feel a connection. So please contact me through pub-craft.com or through using any of the links that I will send around uh, to the coordinators here today, Michelle, Sophia, thank you again, so that they can let you know how to get in touch with me. And I would be more than happy to also offer you some free assistance anytime in that Ask Hubcraft Facebook group. I know that we can't dig too deeply into everything today, but I would be happy to do that and also with a personal approach with you in the future. So with that, I hope that I didn't go on too long and that we have some time for Q&A because I'd love to answer any of your questions. I'll stop sharing and um, Michelle, perhaps I can hand it over to you to get some questions going. Okay, thank you. We'll start on Zoom. Um, Lynette, are you there? Is there any questions in the chat that you can field? And then I'll go to the mic. Um, looks like we have a question from Marco. Um, you can go ahead and read it if you like. It says, would it be effective to make book one in a series free or permanently discounted after it's complete or as it is ending? Yes. So it's could be very effective, right? We're going to talk about the kind of strategies you might employ to do that. So for example, the loss leader strategy we talked about, book one might be, again, more more discounted than other books in the series. So let's say book one is 99 cents or it's $1.99 or $2.99 or whatever the case may be. That would be incentive for people to join it or to read it rather and to get into joining uh, readers of the series. But how we want to make this effective is by um, booking ads around that. So for instance, having it be 99 cents to 2.99 means you have access to all kinds of bargain price promotions. Because again, as we talked about, 
regular price is not as common. So it would mean that you could regularly run a promotion on it. Or if it's exclusive to Amazon, you could do some kind of Kindle Unlimited five day, for example, Kindle Countdown or uh, do it as a freebie. Free is good for when you want to, um, let's say, let's say you want to get thousands of new readers, thousands of downloads in like a three to five day period because you're doing some kind of a promo stack. That's when free is amazing, right? Because you can achieve that. Um, 99 cents is great when you want to make the, that 35% royalty, right? You want to have something coming in from it. Um, but also when you're going to do bargain pricing promotions occasionally just to get new people reading it. It just is an incentive for someone to actually try book one. Something to consider is, well, book one seems obvious chronologically. If your books stand alone, even though they're in a series or they don't need to be read chronologically, maybe book one isn't even the best one to discount. Maybe people love book three, right? Maybe you, all the best reviews in the series are from book three, in which case maybe book three should be the loss leader or more the one that you strategically discount sometimes, Right. So you want to think about how your readers enter the series and what's the best portal, like what's the most highly representative portal into your series, and then make that one available so that you catch them and then they stick. Does that help? Okay, lovely. Anybody in the room have um, a question? If you do, start making your way forward. And anyone else on Zoom, go ahead and look on that one up. Yeah, feel free to pop any questions in the chat. Um, and also, again, if you come up with questions later that you couldn't think of today or they just didn't pop to mind, then feel free to reach out to me with them as well. Or again, join that group and ask me questions there. I'm always happy to help. You can also unmute if you're on Zoom if you want to ask your question directly. Don't be shy. And in fact, while I'm waiting for some of those questions, I'm going to pop a couple of the links I talked about today into the chat. Uh, just so everyone has them. And if, Lori, if you could also email uh, the links so that we have them available for anyone in the room who wants them, that would be great. I absolutely will. Thank you. Doesn't look like I think you did such a good job, Lori, <laughs> that no one has a single question. Go or ahead. I've exhausted everyone, which is okay too. <laughs> I can have that effect. I have a question. <laughs> okay. La last I have chance a question. question. Okay, I have a good. question. Yes. Yeah. Hi. I wanted, uh, just wondering, can you talk a little bit more about post release? Because I think you went through that uh, line pretty quickly and uh, shifted off of that slide there. Yes, absolutely. Conscious of time. So I moved a little quickly through that part. Post release. So would you like me to, to pop up the slide again or just to chat about that'd it? That'd be helpful. Yes, that'd be great. Okay. Okay, we'll do. Let me share that right now. Okay. So in the post release section, this is where we're talking about maintaining contact with your readership. So picking a system that's doable for you, not necessarily, you know, really arduous, but something that you can stick to. And so that way you're not fading into obscurity and having to resurface and make tons of work for yourself every single time. And this is, this is great because it gives you the beginnings of the repeatable system that we're eager to create for ourselves and also allows you to track the effectiveness and to do trial and error. So to post something to see how effective it is, or to try one one promotion or one ad, for example, to try for maybe two marketing events a month and one newsletter a month if you're getting started. For others, it might be a more robust strategy that they've already seen to work for them. But basically, not to disappear and just immerse yourself in the writing cave unless you absolutely have to, um, because we really do want to, even as an active billboard, make ourselves discoverable and visible for readers so that they have a way to connect with us to hear about new releases. So the best way, really have a reader magnet uh, available, have some sort of free download or loss leader or freebie available to your readership and be sharing it so that they can pick up on it, see if they love it, and then stay on your newsletter list so the next time you have content to share, you aren't having to totally reinvent the wheel, but are instead able to give it to them. Thank you so much. That's perfect. Oh my gosh, my pleasure. Okay, we have one question here in the room, Lori. 
I, your presentation was great, and I really enjoyed it a lot. I'm a nonfiction author and also a self-publishing consultant and publisher. Um, I really like the idea of a newsletter, and I've been thinking about doing this for a while for those people that have worked with me to publish their books. And I was wondering, what do you, so I could guide them, what mm -hmm. do you recommend them put in a newsletter? And then I'll think of that, too, for the newsletter that I'm planning to produce. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I will say there will be different strategies for nonfiction versus, versus fiction, obviously, but a lot of best practices still remain the same. For example... Um, something that I always have authors do when they enter into my visible author method coaching program is I have them write a positioning statement. And the positioning statement essentially defines what, who their audience is, what they offer, what's really special about their books, and then reinforcement for that. And there's a whole formula to follow on it. But having this positioning statement is so key because it provides the foundation of all of the content you're going to share. So for example, you know, Let's say you have a, a friend or a sibling or someone and you see a funny comic or a meme online and you're like, oh, I got to send that to so-and-so. And then effortlessly, you just send it to them, right? It, you don't even think about it. You're just like, oh, man, they're going to find this hilarious. Or I'm going to show it to them later when I see it. We want to build that relationship with your readership. And that's going to be unique to your content and what their interests are. So that's why it's so fundamental that you understand your readership, because then the content flows more easily. You're not struggling to think of like, oh, what should I share? It almost comes really naturally because you know what they're interested in. And often it's a mirror of what you're interested in. Not always. We're not always a mirror for our readership. But often what we're writing, the fact that they love it, and that's, that's our readership shows you that you like the same concepts. So maybe they're also going to appreciate, um, inspirational quotes, or maybe they're also going to be interested in a certain type of education or training, or maybe they're going to really like specific memes or, um, like blogging content articles, that kind of thing. Uh, kind of three things you can think about when you break down your content are, is it educational? Is it inspirational or is it entertaining? And it doesn't have to be just one. But usually it falls into one of these categories when we are writing content, um, and then sometimes all of them. But more often than not, it kind of slots nicely into one. So defining that positioning statement, defining what it is you're offering and what your readers want from you, whether it's nonfiction or fiction, that allows you to be really clear on what you offer. And when you're clear on what you are offering that is of value, regardless of the content you're producing, then the formula becomes pretty simple, right? You you have your offer. You are going to create the content to support your offer, to connect with your ideal audience, which is supported by how well you know them and what they're looking for and how well you're solving their problem. And then uh, you keep consistent content at that. You have these touch points and that's how you move towards sales. So something that um, a lovely coach that um, I work with always says to me is specific equals sales and broad equals broke. And this is an easy thing to remember. The more specific you are and the more you understand what you're offering and what your readership wants, then uh, the more likely you are to have that connection point. And you don't want all the fans that are out there. You want your community. And then it makes it much easier to serve them because they're so, they're so niche and you know what they like. Um, I will say that in some ways, I think nonfiction uh, can be a lot simpler to achieve this with than fiction, because when we look at nonfiction, we really ask, what problem are we solving? What problem are we solving? And then when we have the answer to that, which is a lot to do with the positioning, when we have the answer, then we keep providing content that solves that problem. And then one of my favorite things is um, smart marketing is about help, not hype. So do offer something helpful. How are you serving them? Keep thinking about the problems they're facing, their pain points, and then how you can how you can help them with that. Now, with fiction, that's a little harder because we ask the same questions, but then we're caught in like a fictional universe. So I say, what problem are you solving? And you go, I don't know. And I'm saying, you're solving the problem that this person really wants a romance with the boy next door. <laughs> you're solving the problem that this person really wants a fantastic adventure with so many interesting in characters that um, they'll miss when they turn the final page, right? These problems aren't so obvious. So they require, I think, uh, more thought. Uh, but nonfiction, I think, is very exciting because uh, you really are solving a problem for someone most of the time with nonfiction. 
Um, so you can really zero in on that and continue to provide helpful content. And then, of course, uh, there are all kinds of strategies for newsletter management about onboarding and sequencing and re-engagement campaigns. And I, since I can't get into all that today, but I'd love to talk to you about it separately. Um, I will say that your first newsletter, when you welcome someone onto your list, should be a reinforcement of why they're there. So those three questions we talked to but in Three Second Social, you should remind them. They're not going to remember in all the many emails that are arriving in their inbox why they cared about this enough, uh, unless they check it right away. And when they revisit it, you want reinforcement for why they're there and what problem they're solving. And then as you move forward from there, you want to add value in some way, educational, inspirational, entertaining to each email that you're sending. Uh, and always remind people in uh, as many creative ways as you can think of why they should care. Does that help? She she is coming back over to the mic. Hold on. Okay, good. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you. Yes, that helped a whole lot. I really Love appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. Nice to connect with you. All right. Any more questions from anyone on Zoom or in the room? Okay. It looks like, boy, such a huge amount of information coming. <laughs> Fast and furious. It's it's <laughs> it's almost overwhelming for for uh for us i know it was for me at this it's point. a lot that's <laughs> fabulous information fabulous information do you have any closing statements you wanted to make oh uh, well i well, thank you again so much for having me today and again i do know it's it's info packed um and again i'd love to dig into things one-on-one -on -one with anybody who would like to i have discovery calls available so we can jump on and just dig into what you're working on sometimes that is what's needed uh, rather than hearing about the general best practices and in the chat, I've sent links to some of the resources I talked about today, and I will send them as well to the coordinators so they can send it around to um, members as well as those who are on their mailing list. So another incentive to join their mailing list. Um, and please feel free to reach out to me at hub-craft.com anytime. I'd be delighted to hear from you. Okay. Well, then I'll pop off for today, but thanks so much. I see Sophia is there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much, Lori. This was a wonderful presentation. And I don't even I don't even have a book in the works whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I'm I need to write the thing first before I, I even think about um promoting it. And yet I was enraptured the entire time you were speaking. So uh thank you very, very much for speaking with us today. And I'll remind everyone that um if you would like any um of the information that has been shared today, any of the links. Uh, please be sure to email the Down Valley Writers Guild because we will make sure that it gets to you. Yes, thank you, Lori. And um, I do have books in the works, and you will be hearing from me uh, <laughs> probably in the next few months. So thank you. I look forward to it. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right. Next month, we have Clay Stafford coming back. Some of you may remember him from last year. Um, he is... Uh, an American best-selling and award-winning author, poet, screenwriter, and playwright. Also, film and television producer, director, showrunner, actor, book, film, and stage reviewer, as well as a public speaker. So, as I said, he has spoken to us before. This time, he's going to be talking about the art of storytelling. He sold nearly 4 million copies of his books and has had his distribution in 16 languages. He is a founder and CEO of the annual Killer Nashville International Writers Conference, which is happening, I think, in May. And he's a contributor to Writers Digest on a regular basis, That's the magazine, both on online column currently, Killer Writer. And for more information, you can always go to claystafford.com. He's going to be, um, he's not coming here from Tennessee, unfortunately, next month, but he will be with us. And uh, we really enjoyed him last year. And this year, the art of storytelling will be a nuts and bolts dive into how to put your book together, I'm assuming. Anyway, um, that is on the 20th of April. Just remember, if you have enjoyed today's event, email the guild, let us know. There'll be a survey going out from Lynette probably right after this meeting. And uh, we always would welcome you to join officially if you're not already a member. See you guys next month. Thank you.